Hello, everybody. Welcome to Untether.tv. You know why you come here. This is the place where we try to get behind the scenes. We look at how this industry, this mobile industry is growing. We look at the guys and the gals who are pioneering this industry, building stuff that you don't even know that you need, but you'll wake up one day and be using it. This is the best part of it because uh, when you bring innovators on, it starts to spark the imagination. And maybe if you're an entrepreneur out there and you're thinking about what should I start, maybe you'll get the ideas. If you're a business, you're trying to figure out where do I begin in this industry, maybe you'll get some ideas here. My guest today is an entrepreneur. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think, in fact, I read somewhere that uh, that the word and the concept of hustle was invented after they met this guy. He's the founder of Flowtown, which was acquired by Demand Force in 2011. He's an angel invent. Uh, he's an well. He's an angel investor in companies like uh, Get Around, which you've seen here on Untether, Udemy, Wordlens, Unbounce, Manpax, which is an Ottawa company. I'm so proud. Plancast and Food Spotting. He's an advisor to Hootsuite, which is a Canadian company. Lenny Rachitsky, who you've seen here, his company Local Mind. Ken Sito, who you've seen here three times, his company Massive Damage, and he's also the founder of a company called Clarity. And we are going to talk about that eventually. Today, I'd like to welcome Dan Martell, who is all of that, but I think just wrapped up in one word, the hustle. And he's also Canadian, live from Moncton, New Brunswick. Man, Dan, thank you so much for being a part of this. What an intro, Rob. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, you are everywhere. We're going to try to cover off as much as we can in a short period of time because you have, uh, you know, you're prolific, you're, you're everywhere, but what are you doing in New Brunswick? You're, you're San Francisco based now, aren't you? Yeah. So, uh, when I started Clarity, um, I really wanted to start building kind of the ideal lifestyle. And one component of that was, um, having a team and a startup, you know, portion of what I'm doing now based out of here so that when I'm visiting family, um, I still get my, uh, my fix. So you have, you actually have a development team in New, in New Brunswick? Absolutely. Yeah, I've hired some of the smartest engineers uh, from Atlantic Canada, guys that worked at other big um, successful companies um, to have them join me and, and build out what, I'm, what I've got in vision. See, most people think of New Brunswick. Uh, well, many people don't know where New Brunswick is. Um, you know, look, look up and look right and on a map and you'll see New Brunswick and, and in Canada. And, and, but it is one of the most connected provinces of our nation. Like it's built on top of fiber glass, isn't it? Yeah, it was one of the early um, commitments uh, from Frank McKenna and Jerry Pond, who was the previous um, CEO of MBTEL, was to lay down the foundation for, I, I believe it was the first full fiber optic network in yeah. the world. Um, and that foundation and then the call center industry um, definitely brought technology to this area in a pretty big way. Well, there you go. You see, you learn a little bit more about Canada every time you tune in here. And um, and you, you can see that it, there's a, a hustling, uh, a bustling part. I'm going to pull up Dan's website because what he says right here is that He's Dan Martell, Canadian entrepreneur investor. And that's what I love about it is that, uh, you know, we were talking about this before we, we went on the air is that, that uh, just like the musicians we see, great musicians come from Canada as well. But you wake up and you're, and you're humming a musician or, or a song from a Canadian musician. You don't know how it got in your head, but it got there. It's the same thing with tech entrepreneurs is that they are, they're everywhere. And I just named a few of them that are doing this. We have a very, very, very robust tech startup scene, don't we? Absolutely. I mean, most people don't realize uh, Radiant 6 and Q1 Labs, a billion dollars worth of exits out of Moncton, or not Moncton, but New Brunswick as a province. Um, what, what can I say? It's, it's amazing. Why wouldn't I build you know, my new company here? No kidding. No kidding. All right. Well, listen, let's, uh, you know, obviously um, accomplished, uh, you, you know, you've had, you're accomplished in many ways from an, uh, from an angel investor and seeing some things in some companies that a lot of people didn't see in some of the companies, but also you, you founded Flowtown. Let's, let's start there. We're going to work a little way back and then go a little forward into clarity uh, because I love the concept of clarity. It's, it's going old school with the new technology phone focused, which is, which I love. I, I still think it's the killer app for, uh, for smartphones is that you can, pick it up and talk to anybody anywhere on the planet in the world. Yeah. So talk about Flowtown now for, for just a little while. What was it? Um, how long did you run that? And then, or, and then uh, talk about that exit. We'll talk about the exit to demand force. Yeah. So, I mean, Flowtown had kind of two distinct lives. Um, we, uh, started the company in 2009. My, my co-founder co Ethan, um, and I out of San Francisco, and the problem we wanted to solve was social media marketing for small businesses, much like uh, email marketing has been solved by MailChimp and um, iContact, Content Contact. I just felt like with social coming, there was no 
a similar tool in that space. So that was the problem we started solving. And uh, what a lot of people knew us for was the ability to take their email marketing list and, and find all the public demographic and social information on those emails. And then once those were in Flowtown, we'd also provide other services and tools to kind of enhance engagement and marketing around that. Uh, so we did that. We ended up getting profitable, raised money uh, from great investors like Mitch Kapoor and Dave McClure and um, Travis Kalanick, who's the founder of Uber. Um, and we had a ball. And uh, after 11 months of growing 30% month over month, we got a call that said the way we were doing what we were doing was, was no longer. Facebook changed their terms of service due to some other bad actors that we got um, kind of pulled into. And um, yeah, we essentially had two months to figure out what Flowtown was going to be going forward. Uh, so we actually went to the whiteboard, came up with three different ideas. The one, uh, built them all in a two week period, uh, put them live, test them with customers. And we ended up picking one called ambassador. It was a project name, but ambassador was a really easy way to identify your most passionate fans and then give them free stuff over social media. So that it was all done publicly. And, uh, the core customer that ended up loving that was, um, agencies, social media agencies. We had Vayner media, Edelman, I mean, you name it, they were customers. And, um, that ended up being the technology that demand force acquired, uh, late last year. So what was that like? I mean, what a ride, you know, obviously from the, the, the height of, of, uh, gaining traction and then all of a sudden kind of having it pulled out from underneath you. And I guess that's the challenge of, uh, leveraging somebody else's platform to build your business, isn't it? You're a living example of that. Um, mm. yeah, I mean, to me, uh, what, first, what's it like? I mean, it's like getting kicked in the <laughs> junk, you know what I mean? When you're down. Uh, but I, I, you know, what's funny is I've been doing this for 10 years and, and I, it's not like I want it to happen, but it's almost expected. Uh, if you're trying to do anything really progressive and innovative, somebody's not going to be happy about it or something else is going to happen. And, and to me, it's how you react in those situations that decides success, not how successful you were before or after. So, um, you know, the things that we did is, you know, first thing we, we reduced our burn again, lessons I learned in my previous company, sphere technologies. Um, you know, so as soon as we got shut down, we were 12 employees, went down to four, um, that, you know, increased our runway significantly. Uh, we then got back to product and looked at the assets that we had and figured out how could we go to market with a product that would have the best leverage and then, uh, and then iterate and tune from there. I mean, we started off trying to solve small business marketing, that's what we were doing. And then we got shut down, built a new product and realized the core customer was uh, agencies, which is a totally different pricing model and business model, executed on that and uh, and then had an awesome outcome. But it, it just shows it's tenacity, right? That's what that's what you've got here is absolute tenacity. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it's, you know, when you asked earlier, mentioned like, what do I look for in entrepreneurs? It's it's that relentlessness of I will be successful and maybe it's not this current um, kind of iteration of the product, but trust in me that I will make the best decision and be resourceful, et cetera. And if you find people where you feel that that's the case, they're usually going to be successful. I, and, you know, based on who you have uh, put money into, the companies that you put in money's, money into, you can see that because I've sat with a bunch of these guys and, and, I, and I see it. Um, you know, it is a it is a tenacity. Not only have I sat with them like I'm doing this with you, but but I've gone out of my way to get to California to meet with Lenny, right? Because he's that kind of a guy. And I, and I go to Toronto and I see Ken Sito and because he's that kind of a guy that you want to be around. And you see that. He's just like, well, you know what? Ken's story is so great because he was doing something different, realized that that's not what he wanted to do, went to Montreal, was incubated, came out with massive damage, right? And, and that kind of change on a dime, that's what tenacity is. That's, that's just, we're going to do it. Yeah, it's kind of weird because it's, it's, it's a double sided. It's tenacious and resilient, but also coachable, right? right. right? Because as I've met a lot of people that had the tenacity, but they were very closed minded and not open to feedback, which meant they, they, they reduced their ability to learn. And usually in this space, it's definitely your, your speed of learning that's going to decide if you're going to succeed or not. Uh, that's, that's really interesting because it, it is like there, there are, um, uh, you know, we, we're here to talk about the mobile space and, and what you're doing with Clarity. But, but the mobile space has, you know, has, has kind of opened up this democratization of entrepreneurship, right? Everybody can be an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter. North, it used to be a, a really North American focused endeavor, European focused endeavor to be an entrepreneur. But now, now it's a global thing, but do you think that it's um, maybe we're way off here? But I got to ask: Is that do you, do you think that we can, uh, you know, democratize entrepreneurship uh, the way that we're doing it now, or is it uh, is it just a, a specific type of person? 
I mean, it's always going to be a type of person. And, and it, this is actually, we can go off on a tangent, but <laughs> this is what I've learned. Um, and it's a question we don't talk a lot about in, in, in this world is most entrepreneurs I've met, if you ask them, uh, did you grow up in a chaotic environment? The answer is usually yes. There's something there. So um, I don't always know if it's culture, but I do think that there's certain things that people go through that, that, you know, at a very young age that teach them certain skills that are very conducive to being a great entrepreneur. And every great entrepreneur that I've met when I've asked them that 99% of the time is yes. And here's what it was. And it's, it's pretty interesting, right? It's, it's real. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case. It's not required, but it's definitely uh, part of their story. And, and to me that, that happens all over the world, but there's definitely cultural things like, you know, Americans just have this great ability to, feel like it's their dream to just, you know, create and conquer anything they put together and in other parts of the world, especially in Canada, people feel like they don't deserve it sometimes. Like it's, it's not for them to think that big and we got, we got to fix those problems for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's the humble nature of the Canadian where we apologize when somebody bumps into us. Right. And I love it. It is. It's a very unique culture. And, um, but it, there comes a point where I, I've seen de- defeat happen where it shouldn't be happening because of a mental block, not a, a, a talent or a skill block. Right. Um, mm. so uh, sh- shift this to the, to the mobile space before we get into clarity, because I'm very interested to know, um, you know, what, what your perspective is. You, you're up in, you're up in Canada, you're down in the Bay area. You see what's happening on both sides. You couldn't probably pick, you know, it's opposite sides of the continent, pretty much of the planet. But, um, I mean, what was it, what is it about mobile that's, that's so appealing right now, uh, for you, for some of the companies that you've invested in, because there are quite a few of them. Um, but what is it about mobile that that's attractive right now? Aside from aside so, from so, Instagram and a billion dollars and all that crap, the the real stuff, right? Yeah, it was it was attractive even before Instagram. They just made it, I guess, more prevalent and aware and brought awareness to it. Um, you know, I, I look at this thing, right? This this phone, and uh, especially I travel a lot in the airports, and it's it's an organ, right? It's an extension <laughs> of the person's body. If they didn't have it, they would feel like they, you know, they didn't have their left foot. They would, you know, go get their phone. So that's really interesting. So it's, it's always on, always available. It's part of, you know, their, their consciousness. And then the other thing is the application economy is, is, is actually getting away from the search economy where, um, somebody has a problem, somebody recommends an app. And then for as long as that app delivers on that promise, they're going to keep using it. And it's, it's an icon and it it has uh, the ability to bring people back into it with notifications. Um, that's super interesting. And then I'd say the third thing is, uh, the fact that you're constrained by this small screen, really forces you as a product person or as an entrepreneur to uh, solve very specific problems in a flow instead of just filling up a screen because it's white space and you need to put stuff there. And the constraint and the restriction of only designing for this little device um, is actually creating better products and better experiences for users and the way they want to solve their problems. Well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, we, we went through a, uh, a stage of, uh, of bloated everything, right? Where, where uh, it even happened with, in the internet space with the browsers. The browsers started off as lightweight windows onto the web. And all of a sudden, uh, people were abandoning the bloatware and going to, uh, you know, open source initiatives um, that, that were thin, thin clients again. And then they started getting bloated. So um, you're right. The, the UI and the experience um, around the mobile space has to be constrained because you've only got a small screen. Um, what about what about the impact that you you you, you think that we're going to start to see from from this space from the fact that we're car- everyone is carrying one of these everybody's moving away from direct search and everybody is um, I mean knowledge flows freely everywhere you go what what, what are we going to see and you can buy anything from anywhere yeah I think I think the biggest thing that we have yet to tap into is location and um, essentially monitoring certain activities. So people have gotten into that with like Fitbit and, um, you know, um, you know, RunKeeper and like just this idea of like tracking everything as a passive data collection uh, is huge and has yet to be tapped into in a big way, I think, but it's, it's definitely at the beginning stage. Um, and then location, just, you know, being able to show you and filter results or information, you know, without you having to tell the service or the product, you know, where you are, um, I think is, is, People under, you know overlook how important that's going to be for discovery and commerce and um, social features, et cetera. I mean, you know, I think you know hyper local is the future, and this device is going to enable it, not 
not the web browser. So what does that mean to you, though? Like, is that, um, I mean, hyperlocal is a, a term that's that's used used quite often, but even even with your company with Clarity, and, and we will get there, but a lot of these guys, like the, the, the companies that you've invested in, local mind, um, when we talk about massive damage, it, it is a location-based game, right? And what, even when you talk about something like food spotting, um, the, these are all, and get around. I mean, get around is a pretty cool tool, um, but, but they're all hyper-local, hyper, hyper, hyper-local. Um, so talk about that. Is, it, is location going to be around f um, finding things or buying things for you? Um, I, w I mean, there's this trend called collaborative consumption, which is the, the migration of ownership to um, kind of passive rentalship or, or kind of buy the drink usage. And that's where get around and, um, you know, Uber to some degree, Airbnb, um, et cetera. They're solving that. And that's where hyper local. If you think about it, there's everybody has resources and um, and, and physical objects and, and whatnot. And if you can create a marketplace like Zarly, Zarly is a great example. Local Minds is a great example. Zarly says, I would pay X for Y. I would pay $20 to borrow your power cable for the next hour because I'm at the airport. Um, and anybody that's subscribed to that current location that has a power cord can go make 20 bucks. And it's those opportunities in real time in a hyper local way that are going to get unlocked that I think it's both uh, a selling thing um, you know, on the, on the demand side and then uh, the ability to find um, you know, people to buy, right? So it's, it's going to be really, I, I think we're, again, just at the beginning because, you know, if you look at all these from office space to car sharing to apartment sharing to vacation homes to, to high-end sports car to boats to food, I mean, people are doing it by, you know, sharing meals. You know, they cook enough for four and they can invite four people and make friends. It's really just at the beginning. It's neat. Is that, I, I mean, I, I look at that as expiring inventory, right? So that, that it, it, you know, the minute it starts or the minute the game begins or the, the movie starts or, you know, the minute the day starts and you haven't found somebody to occupy it, you, you, you know, it's just like, I mean, it's, it's exactly like get around where you start to think about, you know, my car sits, what's that, 18, 19, 20 hours a day. That's expired inventory. I'm losing value on it. And that is a big industry. And, and now you start to look at everything as as a commerce vehicle don't you absolutely i mean your desk space if i have to go away for a week why can't somebody come and co-work at my space and you know i mean even like golf you know i, I know a startup working on in the golf space same thing right tea times expire if nobody tees off then it's gone inventory and i just think there that the daily deal space was the beginning of a trend that's going to be more around yield pricing inventory and then also um, capacity, like how much are you willing to buy at one time? So it's like Groupon plus expiring uh, inventory discounted over time instead of like a Groupon. It's, it's here, but if you, you know, I mean, they're doing that with Jets now, Jet Suite, right? Last minute, like they have the inventory and they discount it as the capacity is there. Well, I haven't, I haven't yet figured out how to actually make money off of renting my family out. Uh, that hasn't worked it yet, right? <laughs> There's got to be a way to I put get, them to work. I get charged for it. Um, yeah, and then uh, what about what about the the impact of uh, on, on actual commerce on retail? Do you think that that um, we we are really touching on that yet, or because you know there's all this talk about pop up stores, a location based marketing, and and uh, you know we put basically um, uh, you know uh, well the pop up stores are, are a perfect example about this, but uh, geofencing around stores and malls is that is that that's just the beginning. It can't be the end game. You know, I mean, on the retail side, for me, when I look at what Apple's done, you know, the, the, the distinct experience between Apple and Best Buy, like it blows my mind that I go into Apple and there's people asking me what I want. They bring it to me. They grab my credit card in place, mobile, swipe, I'm out, done. I go to Best Buy and nobody wants to help me. I can't figure out what it is. And then finally, when I buy it, I have to bring it all the way to the front. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. So I think for retail, um, they're definitely going to get disrupted by mobile and location. And the way they compete is on service and really making sure that the transaction that I could have did on my Apple Mac device or on the Mac store and the Apple iPhone app is as fast and, um, and great as an experience than being able to go into a physical store. Because if not, why would people go into a store anymore? Well, well, and, and, and they're facing that issue now. Uh, why would they? You know, and I think that, you know, even companies like Red Laser that began this revolution just by a simple barcode scanner and checking to see if a price was cheaper on Amazon or around the corner kind of heralded in a, 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 new, a new world. And 
one that I don't think that we're ever going to get away from, the one that that uh, that has really disrupted retail for forever, I believe. Uh, and you know, so, on that, are there any other industries that you're looking at right now that you think, um, man, they're done, or oh my god, they have to shift, or else this is going to be a casualty of of the mobile of, of the mobile, I mean, revolution, if we can call it that. Do you see anything out there? Yeah, um, I mean, the obvious ones like transportation. Yep. Um, you know, obviously the hotel industry already got its ass served. Sorry, I'm not sure. Um, with Airbnb yep. and, uh, you know, I think these big categories, um, you know, again, transportation, get around and, and, you know, th- that space and, and even task rabbit, right? Like low, when you asked about your family, it came to mind after like, you can make them, make them runners on task rabbit <laughs> because there you go. It's, um, people that, you know, can, can run around a city and execute on those tasks. And one of those tasks can be shopping. I mean, I use TaskRabbit to do all my laundry, all my grocery shopping, any errands I have to run so that I can focus on that thing that I do best, which is build product or hang out with my family. So I think that the mig- what's going to happen, the biggest trend that I'm seeing is the uh, migration from having a job to being uh, task-based employment. And anybody who's been an independent contractor already knows what that feels like. But I think these services are going to allow more people to do that. I know people that buy and lease uh, apartment space and rent it on Airbnb and make an income from that. People are going to start doing that with Get Around by buying or leasing cars and then, you know, becoming the, uh, you know, the mini, you know, rental car company between the market. Um, ex- you know, and that's just going to happen for for a lot of stuff. So, you know, I... I- we're speaking the same language. We, I, I love this because, uh, you know, I, I don't think that there is an industry. I don't think that there is a nation. I don't think there's an economy that won't be impacted by what we're starting here. And and we're kind of on the gray area. We're on the fringe of what's about to happen. What kind of companies are you looking at right now that 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 are that start are starting to fray? That, well, starting to get away from the fray and into the real meat. The guys that are that are the visionaries, the companies that you see that are out there doing the things that are really going to change the world. Um, do you see, do you see any of those companies forming right now? Or are we still on that periphery of, of making an impact? No, I mean, it's, 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 you know, I think we're, we still haven't crossed the chasm for a lot of these innovations. So, you know, I think we've got a lot of opportunity cause there's the late, you know, the laggards and whatnot. I mean, with anything, people are like, well, I don't get that idea. It's like, yeah, but you don't even get Facebook still. So <laughs> I'm okay. You know, it's the, the early adopters that if they didn't get it, I'd be in trouble. So, um, you know, I think the, the device, like um, bringing a lot of this stuff to old school industries like farming, right? Like why don't farmers have iPhone apps that monitor their production plants and, and yield and quantity and educate them on when they should plant and kind of where they're at in the production? I mean, point of sale systems and every vertical, we've seen that in the small business space. Um, and I think that's just going to keep going. And then introducing SaaS subscription, kind of a monthly purchasing I mean, just that people don't really look at as innovation, but when you apply that to the old model, which is like the Oracle, give me hundred thousand up front, et cetera. It's like, no, let me, let me use the product that really solves my business. Like Yammer, right? Yammer came in, um, and people it, Dropbox, like those, I think those business models applied to a lot of other verticals are what's on the, the horizon from a true innovation because they have yet to really, I mean, I'm sure farming equipment and farming automation software is still done with the sales guy, et cetera, et cetera. But those farmers have iPhones now and they can search the app store and somebody's going to build the phone uh, solution for that. And they're going to undercut and go direct to, direct to the, the, the purchaser. Uh, you must be looking at, uh, at at the rest of the world, outside of North America, outside of Canada and the United States. We're very connected. Canada is a very, very, very connected country, and the states are as well. And, and, and uh, in, in relation to each other, North America is incredible. But you must be also looking around at, at developing nations that kind of bypass the Internet era, bypass the big screens and the browsers and all that stuff, and went directly to mobile as, as a way to, to kind of gauge where we are in North America and what the opportunities that you can look for are. Do, do you do that um i don't you know what i've learned um by doing that is a lot of them are actually just doing copycat like it's in i'm not saying everybody right i don't want to generalize but the other day i was on a phone entrepreneur from uh from germany and uh i was like how can i help and he just pretty much said i am building a shoe dazzle clone and blah blah blah. and i was like why are you doing that and he says investors only invest in ideas that are proven first in north america wow wow that's interesting but if you think about that concept from a risk profile, it makes a lot of sense is why would I invest in something that's absolutely unproven when if you just take 
you know, fab.com or airbnb.com or Uber and copy it here. We already know that it works as a business model. Really smart investors in the Valley have invested in those companies. Let's be first in this market. Um, so I actually think that uh, there's not, I mean, other than Japan and just the way the social norms where, you know, identity and social networks are, are kind of more fake. They don't actually have the concept of real identity. They don't like that. Um, it's more um, social and gaming is, is why they use their device versus productivity and kind of um, task-based kind of approach to stuff. So I think either we're going to start doing, and I think that's where Zynga is already starting with it, and, and um, location applied to gaming like um, Massive Damage and uh, what they're doing, I think that is, is, is either them influencing us or us getting there first, and then there's just going to be this blend. I think they do things differently, and we're going to learn from that, and, and we'll probably copy some of those really good ideas and, and vice versa. Do you think that uh, do, you, do you think that that uh, pure play mobile companies like so Instagram is a perfect example of this and and uh, it's a pure play mobile company they they were um, pretty much hung out by their original investors uh, and I think that put a big chip on the shoulder to go and succeed and they, they've certainly succeeded uh, when it came to bringing in users but you know one of the biggest criticisms is they don't have a website they don't have a, a website where you can browse anything and and participate online pure play mobile company it was Instagram. Um, do you think that there is a, a, an ability to, to build that pure play mobile company that is just in the mobile space or, or do you, does it um, have to go across? I think, I think it's definitely possible. The challenge, uh, when I talk to entrepreneurs, they say, yeah, but Instagram this. And I'm just like, look, Instagram was a freaking lottery. Like, if you really try to pattern match, you're, it's, this, like, it's actually really ignorant for somebody to say that because you don't know why. You don't understand the decision-making process. And for you just to do because they did, it's, it's really ignorant. So um, I think, you know, and I knew the Instagram story early because Baseline Ventures was the lead in us. He was the first investor in, in Instagram. The same week they invest, he invested, Steve Anderson invested in Flowtown and invested in yeah. Instagram. And the reason why they went mobile first and never built sites is they didn't have the resources. And the opportunity was so huge. I mean, they, they rode two waves, the social wave, which grows 20, 25, 30% a year, and the iOS wave, which is now 400, 500 million devices around the world. So why would they dilute their focus when the opportunity was still untapped? And it wasn't about like, we don't want to do a website or we don't want to do an Android. It's just, it's what every great entrepreneur should say. It's like, I'm in a market, the market's huge. I've got 1% of it and it's growing you know, 100% every day, why, why would you take, go away from that? So I, I, I really get concerned when people decide that mobile first only because Instagram did it without knowing why they did it. Yeah, good, good. that's great advice. That's great advice. And, and uh, you know, because we do hear these corner cases everywhere and, and they are that, right? Uh, and, and there were these corner cases in, in the web world as well. And, and uh, we all know how that turned out when, when everybody tried to emulate each other or uh, copy each other. Um, so when you look out there, like I mean, you you invent you invested in companies like Food Spotting and uh, and and Local Mind, which I think is a is a uh, is a cool 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 technology, uh, and and it, it fits a it fits a, a need. Uh, with with those kind of things, what what are you looking for now that because uh, those are early on in the in the in in you know you invest in those and these are companies that haven't hit their stride yet because of we don't understand the impact that it's going to make yet for the average consumer. What are you looking at beyond these companies? What what really gets you excited in the mobile space these days? I, I mean, the, the reality is I every investment I make, I kind of ask myself is, do I have this problem or have I done that activity? So have I ever taken a picture of food? I, I just did 20 minutes ago when I, you know, I went out for lunch. So the answer was absolutely yes. Do I want to connect with other people and do that stuff? No, but... Uh, the bet they were making is, hey, if we take this data and then provide a food discovery or kind of, you know, discovery service on top of it, that's a big idea. Local mind, same thing is, have I ever wanted to ask somebody that was physically at a location a question about that location? Yes, right? So if they could solve that problem, there's an opportunity to do hyper-local search, which search is a huge multi-billion dollar market. So the first question I always ask myself is, do I have that problem or have I ever done that activity? And then you know, if this worked, and those are always big question marks, um, is there an opportunity to monetize down the road that is in a market that's big enough to warrant the risk, and et cetera, and, and whatnot? So um, that, that's my filter. It's not really that um, forward looking, more so than, um, you know, finding entrepreneurs that are passionate about that problem and asking myself, is it something I've ever done so that I can feel like I could be somewhat helpful? 
So for the entrepreneurs that are listening out there, uh, just uh, you, you've got to follow Dan. Uh, you've got to follow his Twitter feed. And when he starts to complain about something, uh, look, look. You wouldn't believe. That's, <laughs> That's how it works. Exactly. That's how Unb- Unbounce happened because I wanted a landing page tool and somebody recommended Unbounce. And, I, and then I got to know Rick and we, I knew him for a year and he wasn't raising money. And I begged him, like, please take my money. This is going to be a big opportunity. I, I, I even went with, with, with Unbounce. story so neat because he didn't want to raise. I said, well, here's the extra value I'll add. I'll go grab other advisors that I think are amazing, like David Hauser from uh, Got Vmail or Grasshopper and Rand Fishkin from SEO Moz and Eric Reese and, and, uh, and then brought them part of that investment. And he was like, let's do it. And I mean, those, those are, to me, that is what you got to do if you really want to get in good deals. Um, it's not about the money. The, inv- the entrepreneurs that are having success or doing something disruptive, they don't need money they need the value add and you got to put the work up front and hopefully it works out sometimes it doesn't but that's 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 part so of what it. about what about man packs what was it about <laughs> it solved a problem right the question have i ever ended up with a hole in my sock dreading going to yeah. shop like yes do i think every man goes through this yes would it be neat if it was just delivered like you know every whenever they could guess that that would happen of course so um you know, and it was funny because, like, I knew Andrew for a while, and it wasn't probably. And there's another theme, just so anybody watching this, I like to know entrepreneurs for a while. I'm not, don't pitch me, and I'm not going to invest. Like, that's just, I don't do it for the money. I do it because I like to help people that I, I find fascinating and brilliant and, and trust that they're going to be uh, resourceful with the, with the money I give them. And um, Manpax was that company. And it was, uh, it, was, it was easy. Yes, yes. Yes, I want that personally as a customer, and I think the world wants that. I love it. I love it. I, I, I um, participate in this Bootstrap Awards here in Ottawa, which is a, uh, a local entrepreneur, the guy who actually brought the Ottawa Senators to the city, uh, a guy by the name of Bruce Firestone, well-known, well-respected guy, puts on these Bootstrap Awards. And Man Packs, uh, a couple of years ago, won uh, you know the newest startup uh, Bootstrap Award. And and uh, I just remember thinking, like the video that they did was exceptional. The, the And every guy in the audience was like, yep, 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 I'd buy that, I'd buy that. And you look around at that sea of bobbing heads and you think, okay, that, that makes sense. The, the women want to buy it for their, their, their better half. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. All right. So um, we've, we've talked about this, the past. We spent a lot of time about what, what led you here. Um, you've, had, you've had a number of exits, two, two on record. You've had, you, you're investing in some, well, um, you've invested in, in some great companies, uh, some burgeoning companies, some growing companies. I think some of the, some of the companies that are poised to disrupt, I think a company like uh, Sam's Aid and, and Get Around, I think are, are, um, are incredible uh, in, in what they're about to do and, and, and the disruption they're about to do. So, so I got to just say why yeah, Get sure. Around. Um, not not because I love Sam and he's yep. Canadian. Uh, it was because when I asked him why he started Get Around, he said, "Well, our idea was actually to be able to automatically have cars self drive to you when you need it, and then when you get out, it would self park." But we knew that we couldn't do that yep. now, so we said, "What's the middle ground for that?" And it was Get Around. And I said, "You going for a billion? He said, "Yeah, easily." And I was like, "I'm in," because there's not a lot of people that think no. like that. And when you meet them, you want to support them because if if they if it works, what an amazing world that we get to look forward to. That's that's pretty cool. That's a very cool story. Um, well, that, that's Sam for you exactly. Is that um, and, and you know, I, it it pains me every time I I, I talk about uh, Sam, not because he isn't a great guy or the idea isn't great or or his vision isn't great. It's that he had to leave Canada to go and start this and get it going, and and that's a frustration. But that's a whole other other story. But you've, you've invested in all these companies. You could just take, take a seat. You could advise. You could, you could, you could do other things. You could lead, lead that lifestyle that you want to do. But you turn around and say, okay, listen, well, I'm going to start again. I'm going to do something called Clarity. So um, first off, what is Clarity for those of people who haven't, who haven't uh, you, you know, you're just emerging, you're still in beta, but what is Clarity? Uh, so Clarity is the easiest way for entrepreneurs to give advice and help others over the phone. And, and the reason why I started was after we got acquired um, last October, I started getting an influx of emails and entrepreneurs and people all over the world asking me, you know, f- for time on the phone or Skype or coffee. And, you know, at the end of the day, I've always uh, tried to give back as much as I could. I, I know what it was like building a company in town of, you know, 100,000 people in the middle of nowheres. 
and uh, and the value of a good you know 15 minute phone call that for me a multiple of the multiple times those calls changed my life in incremental ways and I wanted to give back and uh, the first version of clarity was just an easy way for people to add themselves to a call list and when I was driving or walking between meetings I could hit start calls and I would cycle through those calls and call the person and um, and then people saw me using it and that just snowballed and, and in January I said the world needs this and I haven't seen it done the way I think it should exist and you know the other filter was um, and I got it from Singularity University where Get Around was incubated as an idea. Uh, they have a, a motto that they try to find companies that uh, want to affect 10, a billion people positively over the next 10 years. So that was my filter and Clarity fit that because it was a communication product. It was um, something that I feel had an aspirational aspect to it. And, um, and you know, the reason why phone is because phone is universal. Right? People in Japan speak Japanese, they're going to talk to each other. Uh, English is a pretty predominant language. I, I've done calls with guys in Africa to Korea to India and, um, and it's just been amazing to, uh, to connect. And you know, I think video has a higher friction point and I think email doesn't provide context and tweets are really just more nuggets and uh, voice and conversation for me is, is, is still an untapped opportunity. I mean, we joke, uh, you know, I, I believe that voice is still the, the killer app. Um, you know, uh, I use this example uh, quite a bit when I talk is, is that uh, there, there was a moment when, you know, when I first got a cell phone, um, you know, it was maybe late 90s uh, when I started using it, re when I could afford to really start using it, right? It was very expensive back then for those that were not born back then. Um, when it was when it was expensive, but I remember I was in a you know in a Walmart in Florida, you know Fort Myers, Florida, and I was talking to my mother who was flying over northern Afghanistan in a helicopter, and I thought, well, I don't think you can you can communicate. This this, this stuff is science fiction uh, that, that that you can actually just pick up the phone and call anybody on the planet. I think it's incredible. But when you when when you think about this, is that you're investing in some of the you know these advanced technologies, taking pictures of your food, you're renting your car when when <laughs> when you you don't use it. You're talking about um, you know reaching out to people in in locations or bars to get the scene, what's going on there. You're talking about location based games. You're talking about all these things, and then what it, the, the company that you launch is is a, is a direct you know pick up the phone. Any kind of phone. Um, how hard was it to to kind of remove complexity from from what it was that Clarity became? It's hard. I mean, the the, the bet the the accelerating technologies that I'm betting on is mobile and um, social data. And you know, Flowtown had its you know um, roots planted in that, so I know that space very well. And and when you look at location, when you look at um, information people are creating information that's kind of indicating like who they are and what their interests are etc and if we can you know and the social graphs are there on the professional side with linkedin and uh, on the information side with cora and um on the uh, personal side of facebook and if you can start looking at the social graphs if you can start looking at physical location of the person and who they are and their challenges and then try to match that and pair that with somebody and, and it could be in any part of the world and get them on a phone call to talk about their challenges that if resolved can help them move forward. I couldn't, I just can't think of anything more impactful to help leave a dent on the world. I just don't like you asked me, why am I doing this? I don't have to do this. You're right. But I feel like this is an important enough problem that if I succeed, which I'm hopeful, but at the end of the day, I've been doing this a long time. There's no guarantees that it will be absolutely meaningful to the world as a whole. Um, and and that's why I work on it and think about it all the time. I mean, I like it's just we we've uh, when you when you dive into a community and uh, you're, you're obviously you, you influence what's around you typically in, in in the real world. You know, I step out my door. I'm in Ottawa. I'm part of the Ottawa business community. I volunteer my time at uh, the Entrepreneurship Center. I volunteer. Uh, I go for coffee ten times a week. I work with guys like Scott Annan who are out there driving entrepreneurship from the ground up. These guys are heroes, right? That that are out there. But you can only influence a certain footprint, right? Like that's that's ultimately what you can do. So obviously, mobile and, and voice is an enabling technology. Uh, what do you hope? You know, you talk about that a billion people in ten years, but what do you hope it kind of it, it engenders? Because creating a mentor ring creating anything that has to do with mentors. I've tried, you've tried, the world has tried. It's not easy, is it? So no, what do you No, I mean, 
Yeah, I think that the way you succeed is is you um, pattern against ex real world um, experiences, right? So you know, Airbnb, it's very much like, hey, do you have a person that knows uh, where I should stay in New York, and do they have a place I could stay at? So they map to that existing real world, and and getting advice is the way it, it happens today. It's uh, Hey, I, I know you're in Ottawa. I was wondering if you know anybody that could help me with this challenge. I'm opening up a new office, et cetera. And um, with the the great part is, do you know? I already know you know because of the social graph and um, location tells me where you're at, and who you are as a professional tells me other things about your interests and your skills and abilities. And I think that people have an affinity around uh, interest groups, topics, um, and and individuals like young entrepreneurs versus um, not young entrepreneurs or people have raised money who haven't raised. And I just feel like if that information could be surfaced and then those people connected. And then also uh, the part of mentoring that's so rewarding is the circling back with the mentor saying, you said this, I did that, and here was the results. We haven't done that yet. Um, but that, those to me are the, the, the social engineering challenges that we've got to solve for this to work at scale. And I'm taking a very long view on it. It's a 10 year process. I've got all the resources in the world to execute on it. And I think that it's, if, if anybody had this part of their DNA, it's who I am. I didn't get up because I thought that there was a way to make money in this. I said, this has to exist because I need it. And other people that I know would, would use it if it existed. And if those people were the ones giving advice to those first time entrepreneurs versus them turning to their parents, coworkers, or high school friends, the world would be significantly different. I know that for a fact because my life would have been different if I didn't have to fail three times because I didn't have any good advisors. So that's where I look at the 10 billion people impacted positively. If a handful of entrepreneurs decide to start or the ones that have started decide to take a big risk that pans out, and the impact in the people's lives and the communities that they service, I think it's very doable, again, if it works at scale. Well, I mean, we, we talk about this because there's a, a lot of uh, conversation around around social capital and social, you know, entrepreneurs giving back and, and, and people that have um, that have become successful uh, returning the favor, not only to their community, which is typically where it ends up being. I mean, MIT is classic for that. Anybody who graduates from MIT, like Google, they build wings, right, and, as endowments. And, and great entrepreneurs do this. They realize this, that it has to be given back. Um, but, but what, I mean, and, and what you're talking about is, is, is that, is that how many times as an entrepreneur, you guys out there in the mobile space, you've been told you're crazy. You've been told you're nuts that it'll never work. And it's, and, and, uh, and you go back and you recede and you go back to your government job and, and, but you know that in the back of your mind, all you need is that one conversation that helps you move that one step forward. That's what this is about, isn't it? It, it, it like I can't tell you the number a hundred plus people that I turn to for advice on every aspect of my business on a weekly basis that if they weren't in my life I would not have had the success I've had and I try to let them know that and I try to pay it forward because I know I only get to keep what I give away that's my philosophy if, if you want to be wealthy you got to give away some sometimes and it doesn't mean in a financial level it could mean personally or just helping or supporting somebody else that needs it and I think that anybody that's had success feels that, and they, they, we, I just need to figure out how can I create high-quality conversations that they feel are absolutely impactful. That's, that's what entrepreneurs want to do. They just want to have an impact. They want to better leverage their time to help people. And, and, and it's really tough because if you think about it, um, you know, just on the topic of fundraising, it's like, well, raising capital is different if you live in New Brunswick versus Silicon Valley, and it's different if you've raised a seed round versus going for an A or a B or private equity round and there's different people that can help you at different stages and that's why I personally think it's such an exciting problem to solve because it's so multifaceted that um, I spend all my time just looking at the data and trying to understand the social engineering behind the, the solution not can I get two people to talk on a phone technically that's super simple it's getting the two people at the right time to talk on the phone around a topic that they both feel the other person can help them with and that if you can do that at scale That'll, that'll move markets. How are you doing that? Magic? I'm not. <laughs> not um, well, I mean, you need data to do that. Uh, today, we don't do that. What we try to do is enable the person that already has a community to manage that time, that resource, their, their time better. So, you know, what people are doing today is, you know, they get on Clarity as a mentor. They'll tweet out, like, I'm free for an hour. Give me a call. People click through that, that 
uh, link to their profile, click the call button, it cues them up, they're on the phone talking to somebody, as soon as they hang up on the call, it goes to the next person, tells them who it is, where they're from, what they want to talk about, they help them out, hang up, next person. And if you're driving for an hour and you've got, all you can do is talk, why not? Right. And so, so that was really the first level was get the people that have had huge success in life, all the guys that we just talked about on clarity and make them available to their communities. So those community members or followers on Twitter, their friends on Facebook, the people that they know on LinkedIn can call them about the things they already know that they're good at. So the quality of the conversations are nine out of 10 amazing and, uh, and then work backwards from there. You can't boil the ocean. We're trying to really just focus on a lake and do it really well. And then once that works, introduce other opportunities. That's why there's no directory. People ask me, like, how do I know who's on Clarity? It's uh, the, the people on Clarity are using Clarity as a service to offer to their community. They don't want more calls today. And in the future, as I introduce these features that allow you to do um, social currency and the social engineering I've talked about, then, then we unlock it. But they'll decide. They might say, look, you can only talk to me if you've done five phone calls with my other friends or only people that I'm friends with on Facebook can call me or et cetera. Or maybe it's I only do office hours or I only do um, uh, scheduled calls or whatever. So, so really it's trying to understand what the people that have the information make solve their problem first because they're the ones that have that scarce resource and then the supply will come. It's, it's, or the, the, the demand will come once we solve the supply side. Uh, you know, it, it's really interesting because then you can start to put those when you when you when you start to put analytics behind anything, which is the great thing about what you're what you're doing is that that uh, you could actually say, listen, I'm looking for help in in this series A, or I'm looking for help in this. In in my case, I mean, you can you can find me at uh, at Clarity, you know, it's at Clarity.fm/slash Rob Woodbridge. When, when I need some help in understanding how to bring a product to market in mobile, right? Or or I, I need to reach out to Lenny. I want to talk to Lenny, right? So so. Those are the kind of things that when you when you bring that analytics together, you can actually start to then become that that uh, that outbound uh, mentor network where where the people that they're calling have the control of whether or not they want to accept a call or not. But you can really match people, can't you? Yeah, and, and the first level we're doing is is an individual yeah. using it as a service, and then the next will be uh, for incubators that already have mentors being able to route the the companies to the mentors, and then for the executive director that runs these accelerators, incubators to know who are the best mentors and advisors taking calls because right now it's all done yeah. in the dark. I mean, I might I could do fifteen calls today on Clarity or, or, or through a phone and help entrepreneurs, and nobody yeah. would know. And if they're nice enough to say thanks, Dan, for that great call on Twitter. Um, I get some recognition if, if they don't know to do that. So, I mean, those are all things that I should teach them to do in the product. And, and that's what we're doing and unlocking that so that there's social currency and capital created and that capital is used to unlock other things. You know, we, we have the pricing in place today where people charge and if they want, they can take it or donate it to charity. And that was really because we needed a way to filter guys like Mark Cuban and Josh Elman and Dave McClure and Eric Reese. You know, they wanted to be available, but they needed under that constraint today. But easily in the future, it will be under a social filter that will make it so that it's not about the money. It's about who you are as an individual. What have you done so far to show me that we're on the same level to talk? Because I can't help you quit your job to start a business, but I can tell you if you've raised money, how to think about scaling it, you know, if I'm Eric Reese, that kind of thing. That, that's the that's the important piece here, right? Because uh, you, you know one of the things that that I that I read into you and that I've read about read about you is all, obviously this altruism and and it is that social capital. It's about giving back. And and uh, did I read somewhere where you were talking about uh, the revenue that you generate putting that to to a um, to a charity or is that uh, because I, I yeah. yeah so so I don't I don't even so so there's three ways clarity works. Either it's a direct call, a paid call, or a, a charity and. If you do a free call with a charity, after the call, there's a, uh, the person email, gets an email saying, hey, just let you know Dan donates his time to Charity Water. Feel free to make a donation his name. Because I don't want to stop anybody from calling me. As we were on, the, on this interview, I've gotten two Clarity calls. They're in my queue yep. now. And when I'm free tonight, usually I, I go to the gym, 45-minute drive, I can answer those calls. And after those calls, they're, they're prompted to make a donation. Um, I, I just think that the people that need the information get it and then the people that need the money and the resources get it and you know that's the beginning of unlocking it. It's just the beginning because these people like Reed Hoffman, they don't need the money, right? And they already get inundated with inbound requests. I need to make Clarity such a great service for them that they route those inbound requests to Clarity and it 
creates the rules and the code of conduct for that person to engage with them. And if that means they got to go do five clarity calls with people that Reed's friends with on, on LinkedIn before they're allowed to request that call, then that's, then they at least know, then they know. What, how, how does it, how does it work? Uh, you know, I mean, what's the enabling technology behind this to make the calls? Is it just, is it, you know, the person requesting the call just, just calls it's queued. You said, is it, is it, is it a long distance charge? What, what, what is this? We take care you of do. everything. So, so it's, yeah, it's all voice over IP. Um, it's really, there, there's open source technologies like Asterix yeah. that you can use to do it. Um, you know, it, it gets complicated when you do international. We support 85 countries right now. I mean, I've done calls in Africa, um, India, uh, Japan last night. That was awesome. Um, and it, it's, it's just, we don't, we want to make, and that's why people use it today is we have scheduling and the call queuing, et cetera. So the, the, the busy professionals or advisors, they route to Clarity because of that benefit, that they don't have to think about what number do I get a call. They just hit start calls. It cycles through and connects the calls. And it tells them the context, who they are, what they want to talk about. And um, that's just the beginning of what we want to do. And so far, so awesome. I mean, we launched last Thursday, and uh, it's been really fun watching uh, people get connected. Well, I, I remember an early example of uh, something that I saw, which was incredible. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, obviously uh, everybody knows of him or knows him. Um, and when he launched the Thank You Economy, he put these posters all across New York City. And I remember seeing them and they're all over the place. Like, call me. It's an 800 number. Call me. And uh, and he answered the phone for the most part. Right. And I think that, boy, this this can be such a valuable service for guys like Gary or, or guys like me or guys like, you know, Anybody who who uh, who wants to be able to direct people to to uh, to reach out to them, but on their terms, I will talk to anybody, but at the time that is necessary. And and what I love about this is that it just removes the pain, which is my inbox. I don't know, like I ignore my inbox now for email. I I don't even know what to do with it anymore. So uh, because I can't prioritize that because it doesn't do it for me. And I think that something like this really does help that direct communication. We've lost it somewhere along the lines. Well, and 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 when the call comes in through, like Gary did that, and I talked to him about it, is he didn't know who that person was. He didn't right. know anything about it. With clarity, you see who they are, where they're from, and what they want to talk about, and it gives you context so that the conversation is focused, not, hey, I really like what you do. I mean, <laughs> you, you see that. It's like, why do you want to talk? I just think you're great. It's I like, love oh, you, I'm Gary. Gonna, yeah. I'm going to skip to the guy that needs some advice and move forward. And, and you know, we, we just think that it's an opportunity for what I call notable people, guys with audiences and communities to better manage their inbound requests for their time. And not only that, I mean, why shouldn't they be allowed to broadcast that? Yeah. Again, I don't know what I'm going to build, but I know that I'm solving my own problem. And I've been in situations where not only do I want to kill the next hour of time, I also want to allow everybody else that's not on the phone with me talking to listen in because there's probably some insights that they can gather from that. And that could be the context of that call set up beforehand. So people know when they call, hey, this is, you know, you're going to get to talk to me, but it's also going to be broadcast to anybody who wants to listen on the internet. I, it, I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity around voice because it's so pervasive. I mean, Siri, like people, like voices. It's going to come back in a big way, and, and I'd love to see that from a mentoring point of view because it's just different. It's not people are like, oh, it's like core. It's like, no, core is very text-based, et cetera. I mean, it's just you don't – people call me and they're like, I want to talk about fundraising. And then I ask them about their product, and I'm like, you have product challenges, not raising money. Like if you had a great product, you wouldn't have a hard time raising money. So let's talk about the, the product challenges, and that's what gets lost in an email or a Q&A question or a blog post or a tweet. And it really does. We're going to go back to the, the good old days. Um, you know, hopefully when my kids are growing up, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, we'll be wearing formal clothing and uh, it'll be, uh, you know, postage mail and uh, and telephone calls back to that again, because I mean, that's cool. the differentiator. And I, and I and I really think about these these um, the way that we've evolved, but but um, and the way that the entrepreneurs evolved and the way that this generation of, of entrepreneur and successful entrepreneurs evolved and the technology that enables them, like, uh, you know, uh, never, never have we ever had an opportunity to speak to guys like you, to guys like Gary, to guys like any of these guys, um, because they're opening themselves up. Like, I can't imagine, you know, Ottawa here, we have a very successful tech entrepreneur. His name is Terry Matthews. He's one of Canada's, own, you know, uh, very few billionaires, um, and uh, he, he started Newbridge that he sold to Alcatel for uh, twelve or thirteen billion dollars. Wealthy guy, 
Um, but the idea of walking up to him or calling him on the phone 10 years ago never would have gotten through. And here's what else I've learned is Terry is wanting to give back. It's undeniable. He loves young entrepreneurs. He wants to give back under a certain context. And the challenge is actually uh, the callers. And this is the big thing. We launched in New Brunswick as a beta. And the challenge was is culturally it wasn't acceptable to call these people. It blew right, my mind. Right, right. I had guys like Jerry Pond and Marcel from Radiant 6, the CEO. And, uh, you know, all these guys that have made a lot of money and very successful. And people didn't feel like they had the right to, even though they said, call me, I'm here for the entrepreneurs. So there's, there's cultural challenges around that. So, I mean, again, those are product things that I need to fix, but it's been really amazing just to see that it's not even the technology, it's the, the, the mindset of people and, and their ability to feel the merit to call Terry Matthews. Um, you know, the, it, it, it's interesting. It's absolutely interesting. Well, you also think about uh, uh, politicians and, uh, and and how this impacts it. Like, it, it wouldn't surprise me if a year from now you had Barack Obama as a guy that would accept phone calls, right? Because that's what... we've had we've had already politicians on it, tweeting it out, asking, "Hey, let's talk to their constituents." Like, it it makes so much sense for politician, for educators, for I mean, we have Phil Gordon who is like world champion of po- poker. I mean, he's not, he's an entrepreneur in himself, but I mean, he didn't get on there to give like fundraising advice. He wanted to just connect to his community. And, um, I, I just think that if, 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 even if we didn't do anything tomorrow, if we just stopped the calls, the thousands of calls we've already done, it's, it started, you know, the butterfly planted effect. a seed there, there, it has, there are people that think differently because of the conversation they've had with me or others. We have the testimonials. I know it's there. And, um, uh, I think that that just needs to happen on a, on a bigger scale. And the beauty is it's today. It's social, mobile, local, and the data, and it's now. It's the reason why it's happening now is because I have Facebook. I, you can only sign up for Clarity on Facebook. People are like, why? It's because I need to know you're a real person. And in the future, I need to leverage your social graph to make the qual- quality higher. And you're going to thank me for it, even though it's confusing as anything today. <laughs> um, but Again, global and, and social and identity online, it's, ne- it's never existed before. You, didn't, you never had global identity in the world of this is a real person yeah, before. There's no way to validate it. Your postal code, right? No. Your postal code. Airbnb would not work if that no. didn't exist. Uber is going to exist on a l- different level. They're, they're going to go down market and allow individuals peer-to-peer car sharing. That, that, that would never exist. Get around would never exist if there wasn't real identity on, online. And clarity would not work if I didn't have that. And it's a now thing. Absolutely. Timing is right. It's the perfect storm of everything that's come to this. That's why I left. People don't understand why I left because I walked away from half my earnout. It's because I knew there was an opportunity in front of me and I was not going to sit at a desk and vest in peace to execute. <laughs> that's just not my style. Vest in peace and watch the opportunities just yeah. disappear, right? People told me, you were, you, why don't you just chill out? Why are you going back into this? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like... I can't, this is just who I am. It's how I'm wired. And um, I felt like it was the, it was why I did everything in my life up to that point. I had to go do it. So how long do you do this for, Dan? Like, you know, um, like, is this something that you, you build up and, and you solve the, the challenge selling. and then you move on? I'm not selling. Tell, tell you right now and put it on video. I'm not selling. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, I'm not even asking that. It's just like, you know, you know, what it seems like to me is like, listen, it's, it's a, it's classic entrepreneur, right? You, you're, you're looking at a problem square in the eyes and you're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to make it and we're going to do what we got to do. And then when I've solved the problem, are you like an operator? It sounds like you're a starter, right? Like you've got to be in there. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a weird guy because <laughs> I actually started as a developer other than the way, you know, I talk and act, but, um, I was a developer engineer and migrated into an operator. Spheric was a 30-person services company with some technology, and I had to manage that. I grew that, you know, in four years. And um, and then I learned marketing as a byproduct of that, and then Flowtown executed biz dev marketing. Most people don't know I write code. Um, they think that I'm a marketer. So um, I don't know how to classify <laughs> me, but I definitely uh, will, um, I will manage product. Will I have a strong operating officer? Absolutely. But I like to try to figure out where those growth opportunities and execute strategically on them and work with designers and the product people and the engineers and, and then go talk to customers and close deals. I mean, I, I love talking on the phone, obviously. So um, I, I don't know kind of how to classify myself, but I get asked that question a lot. 
Well, I, I mean, I, I've just spent one hour talking with you. How? What's the average length of the calls that you that you kind of get? Is this uh, is this this? I mean, I, you know, I, I it resonates with me because. When I when the reason I do this over video, the reason I do untether over video, and I don't accept audio calls. If you don't have a video camera, I'm so I, I I just can't do it. Why? I mean, it's it's because of these things. It's a distraction, right? Is that if if we're gonna do this, I want you focused. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want you to go off and doing other things. And I think that that's the only reason I do it over video. Try to make it as interesting as possible. But an hour is a long time. How long do the conversations that you have? Uh, you know, what's the average length of these conversations? I mean, just in their system overall, it's twelve minutes. minutes. And yeah, 12 I mean, minutes it's, influences it's, people like just like, it's 12 minutes. Oh, you, you, you can get on the phone. I mean, Peter Pham was probably one of the best, you know, co-founder of Color yeah, yeah. and BD. Uh, I mean, I he he gets calls and answers them. And then people tweet out like that was the best 12 minutes, 15 minutes I had on because they, they, they have very specific questions. And he is the man that's just seen that play out so many times. So he says, here's what I've seen. Here's what I've done. Here's what I would suggest. And the entrepreneur goes, awesome. And they might get on another call with me and I'll give them completely conflicting <laughs> advice. And that's okay because they get perspective from two guys that have seen that happen, which is better than them turning again to their parents, to their friends, to their coworkers who've never done it before, who've never been through it. And to me, that is anybody that's been successful in something, that's how I learn. I, wanna, I, I don't care if you start an airline or a hotel or a small business owner that has a truck and does landscaping. Um, there are patterns that you do that, have, uh, that the reason why you're successful and I want to understand those. And, um, I just, I want to enable that for more people. The calls are short. Wow. This is, this has been incredible. Uh, you know, Dan, uh, uh you know, I, I think that what, what we've got out of this is, is, uh, the enthusiasm, the energy, uh, obviously the entrepreneurial spirit, that hustle that has, uh, that has been classified, uh, you've been classified as, um, and and also, you know, I, I, I always come back to this is that it, it's also about a, a Canadian thing where, uh, you know, we shouldn't hang our heads down. We shouldn't we shouldn't hide from the successes that we've had. Uh, and certainly some of the top, top, top technologists right now are from Canada. And, and uh, I, I classify you as one of these great entrepreneurs from Canada. And, and I can't thank you enough for doing this. I, I don't think you're done yet. Right, and uh, and I think you got to be held accountable to to do the things that you got to do, um, but but I I, uh, I really appreciate the fact that the things that you've done to enable the entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial communities uh, in North America and around the world, man, uh, I think it's great. And and uh, by any uh, you know by the guys that you hang out with and the people that you help around Lenny and around Ken and, and obviously the you know the Cedar Brothers Man Packs. Uh, these these are companies that are uh, that I think are going to change um, along with clarity to change the face of of the way that we do things um, and that's what I look for and that's uh, I really appreciate you doing this man. My pleasure. I mean, Rob, honestly, I got I got to give it to Terry Matthews. Actually, he said in a uh, talk he gave a while ago, six years ago, he said, "If you want to be uh, read, you need to write, and if you want to be heard, you need to talk." And so simple, <laughs> so, so freaking simple. And I was like. You know, so I have no reason to complain that I'm from Moncton. No. I just need to start writing. I just need to start talking. I just need to get out there and communicate. And if any of these ideas have merit, they'll attract other people that want to share in that idea. And to me, that is when you talk about the, the Canadians not doing, we, they, 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 re, they need to understand that if you do not self-promote, if you are not out there marketing, if you are not out there um, letting people know what you've accomplished, not in a boastful way, but as a way to allow them to connect with you on a passionate level, you're doing yourself a disservice and it's not going to, it's not going to enable the community to thrive. I mean, the guys at Radiant 6 spent all of their time on a plane. I watched it. They were in every conference and they're from Moncton, New Brunswick or Fracton, New Brunswick. And I would see them in San Francisco and Austin and New York and Boston. And like they did that. They said, we, we got to go out there and talk and let people know what we're creating. And I, and I hope if anything, if one thing everybody watching does is go tell somebody <laughs> what you've created or what you're passionate about. Even if it's one person, it could be your family member, or your dog. I don't care. Start getting used to storytelling because it's how we're going to let the world know how amazing Canada is and how great our entrepreneurial community actually is. And it's not as bad as we think it is, but we just need to inspire the next generation of guys to start. And, and that to me is what I see in San Francisco is being able to walk down the street and run into these guys, the Zuckerbergs, the Reed Hoffmans, the Peter Thiels, the Sean Parkers, and, and, and learn, and Ev Williams, that they're normal. They're not <laughs> superhuman. They're not, they're not smart like Einstein. 
they just knew that they should get advice from people that were successful and they should never quit and that it was part of a process and and hire smarter people. I mean, that's those are the things. So oh, I hope that more Canadians get out there and tell their story. Well, they should, and hopefully they've been inspired by this. And if you, I mean, go to go to clarity.fm and uh, and take a look and and uh, and and sign up if you are on the on the fence. It's available now for you to sign up for. And, and as you said, I, and I'm slash Dan Martell. So two L's of Martell. Give me yeah. a call. I always get back to people within that's the right day. and or you can just host a uh, a fake tv show like this to get an hour out of his time this has just been totally fake right you know or that's it it's like there is no there's no website yeah you should have done your yeah, you should have done your research on me I, uh, buddy I, I uh oh and you know what i'm open for it as well clarity.fm slash rob woodward just do it I, I mean you know what um you got questions do it um certainly hopefully uh hopefully that you 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 at least see the passion in this and and the fact that this is a warranted uh effort Go to danmartell.com. It's a, uh, you know, there's a blog there where Dan writes. Uh, he's got some some great insight, obviously. Um, and go and support these other companies that, that have been, he's invested in or he's, he's advising. Some of them you'll find on untether.tv. Lenny and Bo, I've interviewed each one of those guys and I love these guys. Same, same with Ken uh, for Massive Damage. Go go and uh, support these companies and go and look at what they're doing because they're very important as well as, as Clarity. And they're, and they're all on Clarity. So figure out the URL format and give them a call. They would love I'm gonna to I'm going to call them. Lenny right now. Dan, you thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time. This has been great. It's been great. Thanks for having me, Rob. Everybody out there watching or listening, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, I so appreciate the fact that you guys come here each and every week, each and every day to listen to these things. Uh, let me know how things are going. Let me know if there's companies that I should be bringing on, people that I should be bringing on. Reach out to me at untether at gmail.com. I love that you do it. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching, Dan. Thank you for being a part of this. We'll see you next time on untether.tv. See you, everybody. <laughs>